Welcome to Creative Solutions for a New World Climate and Artists series. I'm Frances Littman, your host, and I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the Coast Salish people of this region and First Nations worldwide. For thousands of years, the abundance that these lands and waters provide us to live, work, and play is due to the reciprocal relationships by which Coast Salish and the world's first people have lived and live today. I recently had the pleasure of interviewing Rick Tanita, a fascinating man who was raised by William Lethbridge, a Lakota elder who taught Rick the Lakota culture. Rick shared with me that the spirit of the creative process lies in identifying what you want to create, what matters to you. So your creations will exist, he said, only because you chose to bring them into being. People who have practiced the creative process for years have commented that usually at the root of most creations is love. And if something matters enough, we will bring it into being. That's the law of nature. The gift of being able to create what matters is very precious and rewarding. Continually living in the spirit of the creative process can be the heart and soul of a meaningful and rewarding life as it challenges us to ask the question, does this matter enough to me, to us, to create? Problem solving is about making what you don't want go away. Creating is about bringing something you care about into reality. Given that 50 to 70% of climate solutions grow from the ground up, I'd like to introduce you now to some very special people whose creative process has led them to a larger purpose. Sandy Goldie and Jim Bronson live in Vancouver, BC, and have brought free environmental sustainability classes to British Columbia from Ashland, Oregon. Sandy has been a lifelong educator, nurturing her young students to love nature. And Jim comes to this work as a scientist with degrees in oceanography and physics. Jim's love of the outdoors was manifested in his years as an outward bound instructor. Together, they are the force behind BC Drawdown and have been training and inspiring others to lead these classes around the province and beyond. Sandy and Jim volunteered their time and creativity presenting fabulous five session classes, which I myself had the pleasure to take and can say they are truly wonderful facilitators. I highly recommend that everyone sign up for their courses because not only are they informative, they're fun, they're engaging, and they're free. Welcome Sandy and Jim. Dr. Trevor Hancock is a public health physician and health promotion consultant living in Victoria, British Columbia. His career has been focused on health promotion and public health with a particular focus on health in cities and the links between humans and ecosystem health. Dr. Hancock is one of the founders of the Global Healthy Cities and Communities Movement and has been described as one of the 10 best health futurists in the world. He is in demand across Canada and international, internationally as an author and public speaker and has served on numerous national and international expert panels. Dr. Hancock also co-founded both the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment and the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare and was the first leader of the Green Party for both Canada and Ontario in the 1980s. His columns appear weekly in the Times Colonist Daily newspaper, and we are very honored to have him on the board of Creatively United for the Planet Nonprofit Society. In recent years, Dr. Hancock has focused on the concept of a one planet community region as a way to integrate the concepts of healthy and sustainable communities. And in retirement, he has started a nonprofit, Conversations for a One Planet Region to explore and popularize these ideas locally. Welcome, Trevor. John O'Reardon is our climate and arts partner for which these webinars are made possible in thanks to, thanks to John and his late wife, cellist Gail O'Reardon, whose legacy lives on through this series. John O'Reardon is a Victoria Philharmonic violist and choir member. He obtained an MA degree in geography from the University of Edinburgh and a PhD from the University of British Columbia. 
John worked in the public service throughout his career, first with the federal government and then with the province of British Columbia. He completed his full-time work as deputy minister for the Ministry of Sustainable Resource Management. After leaving government, John taught a graduate course in resource planning and public policy at UBC and has since undertaken research on watershed governments, watershed governance for the Polis Project on Ecological Governance at the University of Victoria and on climate change adaptation at Simon Fraser University. Welcome, John. Thank you. You were going to introduce me, I believe. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to and an honor to introduce you, Francis. Francis Lippmann is an international award-winning photographer, a community activator, and a multimedia producer. Akash is bringing positive solutions that foster healthy, happy, and resilient communities. She has voluntarily coordinated some of North America's largest zero-waste Earth Day festivals and sustainable showcases. She is the driving force behind creativelyunited.org, a free community solutions and resource hub, and produces its popular climate and the artist webinar series. She has also co-founded the Community Trees Matter Network. In that vein, she has recently co-produced with Valley Victoria a video entitled Awaken, which de demonstrates, demonstrates powerfully the need to protect our natural forests in and around Victoria. And Her big picture vision has resulted in her receiving a 2012 EcoStar Community Award, a 2017 Victoria Community Leadership Award, and a 2018 Honorary Citizen Victoria Award. She continues to provide transformational solutions for a more just and societal society. She uses her many years of multi-experience to foster positive solutions, recognizing that we both have to be creative and united in effect to effect cultural change. Hence the name, Creatively United. Our opening comments today on creativity attest to her passion for innovation. Since 2012, Creatively United was an, is a non-profit society leading and convening and amplifying public conversations to reduce our ecological footprint. Through festivals, events, talks, educational activities, and free sharing of network for the Creatively United has brought thousands of people together in person and now online to celebrate and unite these committees to a more socially adjust world. Frances is not only a masterful producer and organizer, but she's also a fun loving person who always looks on the bright side. She has a magnetic personality that encourages people to take action, even when they don't know what the hell they're getting into. <laughs> and she's an absolute devil when she rides off on her electric bike. The problem is that she rides off in all directions at the same time. I've known Frances for almost a year and I can truly say that the partnership between Creatively United and Climate the Arts has been a wild but fun ride. <laughs> so here's a short uh, video, I think, Francis, that you want to uh, show us about Creative for the Nineties work. Thank you, John. Yes, we'll show a quick one minute video for those people who don't know what Creatively United is, just to give you a little background about what Creative United offers. <laughs> Thank you. And enough about me. I'm going to start launching right into the questions. So Trevor, let's start with you. Could you tell us how and why you became involved with what you're doing, which is Conversations for One Planet Region? 
The long backstory is that I got involved with ecological politics in the early 1970s when it was just starting and I was still actually in medical school. Uh, and so I've always brought together both health and well-being on the one hand and ecological issues on the other. But the short story around the conversations is simply my own um, commitment both to the notion of local action of healthy cities and healthy communities, uh, as well as my interest in the relationship between the natural environment and human well-being, and recognizing that those uh, natural elements, what we sometimes call goods and services, ecosystem goods and services, are the very foundations, not only of health and well-being, but actually of our existence and the existence of all the other species with whom we share the planet. So that's a big picture of, of ecosystem health, but then how do you bring that down to a local level? And in doing so, one of the concerns that, that became clear was that we're really not even talking about this. So we are talking about climate change, and that's good, although we're not really coming to, to grips with it yet. But climate change is part of a much bigger picture, which I can talk about later. But uh, it, it's a very big um, challenge. But if we don't even talk about it, we're never going to face up to that challenge. So this is about local conversation. We have to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Well done. OK, I'm glad you're doing that. And Jim and Sandy, would you like to share some of your core interests in tackling the climate crisis and tell us more about countdown, drawdown? What is it? What is its genesis and what are you trying to achieve? Well, I'll start out by just saying that, you know, I was a little kid uh, in Denver living with my grandparents and in the afternoons, I would sit in their backyard and I would look at the birds and follow the tracks of the bugs in the ground. And you know, that's what delights me is, is seeing how the uh, natural processes and natural beings are just so alive and so present for us. And so as a scientist later on, I came to the conclusion that we really need to get in partnership with our earth, as Trevor says, with the ecology. You know, we really need to understand how to be in partnership. And so Sandy inspired me so much by getting in touch with the project called Drawdown. Sandy, tell us about Drawdown. Yeah, so I was um, visiting Jim down in Ashland, Oregon one time, and all of a sudden I saw a poster that said, we can reverse global warming. And I looked at the poster and I said to Jim, I am there, I'm at that meeting tonight. And he had another commitment, but I walked into a room in the Grange with about 80 other people down in Ashland. And I could tell it was kind of my, my uh, tribe. <laughs> These people all really cared about the earth, but everyone was kind of uh, discouraged about what's gonna happen. You know, we've got such a challenge ahead of us. Well they told us about this project where over 200 scientists had mapped and modeled and done all the research on um, over a hundred solutions that are actually practical and already happening. And that we do have all the solutions we need. We just need to commit to them and accelerate them. And we can do this. We can turn things around. So, by the end of the evening, I was up at the front saying, excuse me, would you come to Vancouver, BC? And would you help me get drawdown going and spread it across the province? So that's how that started. You're such a soul sister. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've known that for a long time, Francis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Trevor, back to you. I understand that Conversations for One Planet Region has a broader set of interests than climate. Do you want to tell us more about those? Yes, I'd be happy to. We approach things in terms of what's sometimes called the Anthropocene, which is really a set of global ecological changes that are driven by human activity. And the challenge we face is not simply climate change, which in itself is a very large challenge, but the fact that all of these other things you see here and others for that matter are all happening at the same time and all happening in a very massive way at a global scale and very rapidly. The, stoke, the suggested starting date for the Anthropocene is, this, is mid, 20, mid 20th century. So it's as old as me, I'm 72 now. 
And so it started, I'm, I am the Anthropocene in that sense. And all of this together, you take all of these challenges together, and this constitutes what some, some would consider to be an existential challenge. And the problem in a nutshell is this, in this region, and our ecological footprint has been done for this region, and is the basis of the work of a group called One Planet Sanich, for example, uh, is that we, we behave in this region as if we have four whole planets. Well, we don't. We actually only have the one planet. And so we need to figure out how to live within the limits of one planet. We're crossing a series of planetary boundaries. And so we're already moving into the red zone in things like uh, species extinction and phosphorus and nitrogen flows. We're approaching a red zone in climate change and land system change. So we've got a lot of massive challenges. And what this means, which is very hard to get our heads around, is that we actually need to reduce our ecological footprint in this region by about 75%. And we need to do so fairly rapidly. And we need to do so in a way that maintains people's well-being and quality of life. Um, we all want a good life in good health for as long as we can. And also we have to do that in a way that is equitable. So we have to have a just transition to a future society that can live within the means of the planet. And so Will Stefan, who's one of the leaders of a lot of this thinking globally, a leading earth scientist, said in an interview back in December last year, that we need to reach a social tipping point before we reach a planetary one. And so we're about that social tipping point. But our basic presumption, as I said earlier, is we need to talk about this. We're not really having a conversation about what does it mean to become a one planet region? How do we reduce our ecological footprint of which over a half is carbon, uh, carbon emissions, but how do we reduce our ecological footprint by 75% in the next few years or the next decade? That's the challenge we face. And how do we do that in a way that is equitable, that is just, uh, and that is also maintaining a good quality of life for everybody? So if we don't talk about it, as you'll see at the bottom of all of our slides, we have our kind of slogan, we need to learn about it, we need to discuss this. If we do that, we can understand what we're facing and what we need to do. And only if we understand what's going on, can we really begin to imagine and design and create uh, that better future. How wonderful that there's so many of us now starting to do this type of work because it's paramount that people do know you're absolutely right who um who are involved in these conversations and are they underway trevor well the conversations themselves have been underway for a, 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 about three or four years and came out of a project i did at uh, uvic when we when i was teaching there um and they're there are challenges with them in as much as it's a relatively small group of people who get together in person and these days on Zoom. Um, and one of our challenges is how do we expand that conversation to involve a much wider demographic, a much wider group of people, uh, young and old, um, but also how do we disperse that conversation? So we're looking at a number of future projects that we want to do to do that. And that's ideas such as a program on kitchen table conversations. So how do people come together around their kitchen table with family, with friends, with neighbours, or at work with their workmates or in school or in their service clubs or their faith communities? We need to have be having this conversation happening all across the region. Um, we're also looking at how do we do this in more depth? So we're looking at the idea of, of study circles. Can we set up study circles to explore some particular issue? So our conversations over the next four, three months are focusing on value shift. So how do we adopt new values uh, that value nature rather than the economy, that value community as well as the individual instead of being so individualistic, uh, and that value quality of life rather than just more stuff, more quantity of life? Uh, so those are the kind of challenging issues that might make for a very good study circle for people who are interested in how do you bring about societal value shift. Uh, and then we're looking at ideas such as neighborhood charrettes, which I think will have to wait until after COVID, uh, where people come together with uh, design professionals, artists, uh, urban planners, engineers, architects, to imagine and put down on paper what their community would look like, what their neighborhood would look like if it were a one planet neighborhood. I love that. As a visual person, I think there's nothing more powerful than having a visual creative 
uh, reckoning of what could be. And I think that's when people can see that it is possible. So has there been a cultural shift for people to get involved or, you know, you mentioned a value shift. I don't think so yet. I mean, I think it's starting to happen around climate change. It isn't yet happening around the, uh, these wider issues. And um, of course, we're also having the challenge that so much conversation now, particularly in COVID, but even generally, is online through social media. And while we think there's some merit to that, we also think that real conversation can only happen face to face or best happens face to face. So how, and, and the other reason for doing that is it's not just about the conversation. It's that when you have a conversation, you're also building community. And so we have to build community through conversation and find shared vision and shared purpose and then work together on how to bring that about and do so. To, you know, you don't have to change or save the world. What you do have to do is change and save a little bit the way you and your neighbors lived and what we do. I think COVID has helped that actually in some ways. I think we've come to better appreciate the importance of social contact. We've come to better appreciate the value of community, the value of government. Um, and those are some of the shifts. And of course, in the early days of COVID, people were just entranced by the fact that it was so quiet and peaceful, that the air was clean, that they could see the mountains far away. Um, so we're beginning to understand the price we pay for our current way of life. And I think COVID has actually helped to do that. Oh, I would agree. It'd be great to see block captains talking of like, like, like neighborhood watch, but they're talking about all this and everybody adopted a street and took it on with their neighbors. It'd be great. You see how simple that could be? Like I live on a street with maybe 20 houses. It's not that hard. I mean, you could just, you know, go to your neighbors and see what you could do. Sandy and Jim, what steps are you as individuals taking to deal with the climate crisis? What is your community doing? Lots of things. <laughs> I, I have to say, I was really relating to what you were saying, Trevor, about um, creating community. And, and in our drawdown classes, that's totally what we do. Um, and, and Jim and I personally, sometimes I look at the people in our classes and the amazing projects they're getting involved in, and we'll be sharing some of those in a couple minutes. And, and I think, oh gosh, we're only leading classes. And then I think, oh, but wait a minute. Um, we've started adopting a plant-based diet. I love my new electric bike. And for two or three weeks, we didn't even use a car at all. We just decided we're going to walk and we're going to bike everywhere we go. And um, I'm trying to not to buy anything plastic if I possibly can find another way to, to obtain what I really need. So those are just some of them. Oh, one of the other ones that is uh, important, I think, for us personally, but also for the planet, is that we've adopted a plant-based diet. And, you know, I feel healthy. I feel on top of the world. And it's a different orientation. We're not requiring a planet, like T Trevor talks about, a, a multiple number of planets to raise animals. It's a very inefficient use of our planetary resources. And so just the simple act of adopting a plant-based diet is a great way to go for both us and the planet. And Jim, don't forget, Rosie, our Nissan Leaf, hooks up very well with your solar panels at home. So we've got uh, something going there between the heat pump, the solar panels, and Rosie. That's helping us get down to net zero. <laughs> Well, how about you, John and Francis? What are you doing in your lives that are particularly good for you, but also good for the planet? A brief comment, because my particular interest is developing policy. And when I was a deputy minister, one of my wiser ministers said to me, John, first, these are the very first words he said to me when I was, he was introduced as my minister. He says, John, there's the right policy in the wrong time. And there's a wrong policy and the right time. And once in a while, there's the right policy and the right time. Your job is to fashion the right policy. My job is to tell you when it's the right time. And we got everything through uh, cabinet in four and a half years that I worked for him. But the one project that we had the most difficulty with was climate change and climate action in the BC government. And we went to cabinet several times with the right policy, but at the wrong time. Finally, we got it all together and in 2008, 
British Columbia introduced its carbon tax, the first carbon tax in North America. So that has given me a lot of uh, impetus to continue to create new and innovative policies that tackle climate change and biodiversity. And Francis, uh, before I even knew you, I saw this amazing um, booklet at my bank that said 57 solutions for a healthier and happier planet or something. Tell us, you've been doing fabulous things at Creatively United. Well, I had to channel all that creativity because I mean, when you're, when I think creatives, it's, it, you have to create. That's all there is to it. Creatives have to create. So hence why I'm going, as John says, in all these directions at once. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's the creative process kind of and the passion for the environment just uh, as a photographer as someone who's seen through a lens for 30 years of my life, um, you see from I've seen from like a macro looking into the depth of, let's say a flower I think everyone's experienced that now to, you know, the big picture out there with the telephoto and zooming in on things over there and then the, the, the scenic landscapes, just everything and having photographed so many things and so many people, you start, you know, I started to really put the pieces together and see the big picture and the interconnectivity of everything. And as a result, it was just like, oh my gosh, there's so much more we can do. So I've been harnessing the power of my network and my creative uh, resources to do everything I possibly can, including that booklet that you said Van City had distributed through more than 50 of its branches all over um, Vancouver Island and the lower mainland. So that, you know, photography, writing, you name it. So, and these, these kind of uh, programs. So lots of things. And in fact, I've been very busy interviewing so many wonderful people, including eco-futurist Guy Dauncey, Indigenous leader Patrick Kelly, and all kinds of local heroes doing amazing projects from planting and preserving trees to zero waste experts, green builders, an award-winning community connector, plus world-class artist who infuses collective consciousness into his detailed work and many others. We also have numerous videos featuring expert speakers with solutions for many topics. So here you can see our YouTube channel. I mean, it just goes on and on. If anyone you know is looking for something <laughs> to look at, there's no shortage of videos there. So I recommend highly subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll get notifications when we post a new video. So um, I know that John has also been, um, well, getting into all kinds of creative things because John, you're a very creative person and I love the way that you bring it into sort of policy related things. So you, you are working on a project right now that the township of Esquimalt has the potential to be one of those municipalities that could really lead the way for North America showing what's possible with a um, by sending zero waste to its landfill with what's known as uh, its a gasifier. Can you tell us more about this? Esquimalt uh, set out two challenges. It wanted to become, it wanted to reduce its carbon footprint by 30% by 2030, and it wanted to become totally carbon neutral by 2050. And as Trevor has pointed out, it's part of the conversations for a one planet region. And so we need to reduce our overall uh, impact on the environment, both carbon and biodiversity by 75%. So Esquimont said, well, what can we do that's a step change rather than an incremental change? And they fashioned on this solution of coming up with zero waste. And the way they do zero waste is that roughly 10% of the waste is recyclable. That's your papers in the blue boxes, some plastics, some tins and bottles, et cetera. And the other 90% is uh, generally speaking thrown into the landfill in some form or another. A gasifier will reduce that 90% through a thermal process. So it eliminates it completely and creates a synthetic gas, which can be used for heating and for driving the gasifier itself. Plus it makes a biochar as the result of all of this combustion. And that biochar can take uh, carbon dioxide from the air and use it as a soil conditioner so that it actually absorbs more carbon than is, is created in the process. So that's the essence of the gasifier and the experiment is into a public consultative process to see 
how much public support there is for this project and how they can then take it to the next step and make it happen. So regardless whether you live in a squamal or not, the point is, if we want to see more of this in North America, I highly recommend people go to the Esquimalt um, survey. And I really suggest that people take the survey because even though you don't live here necessarily, you could potentially have uh, this solution in your neighborhood. Right, John? That's correct. Um, so back to just one more thing, if you don't mind, I would like to quickly share with you now um, is something that John and I have been working on. It's a 45 second trailer to a short film we created in collaboration with Ballet Victoria, because we love being collaborative and we love to bring uh, attention to important matters. And one of them is protecting and preserving our, both our urban forest and our, and our, our old growth forests, etc. But this film will be premiered tomorrow evening at the opening night performance of Ballet Victoria's Little Prince. And, and we'll share the, the full video next week and know that these types of collaborative partnerships are now vital to inspiring needed solutions. For the love of our home, we are taking a stand. We are a tribe, we are a tribe, awakening, listening to the heartbeat of a New birth, earth is you, earth is me. We're listening to the rhythm of a heartbeat. We're listening to the rhythm of a heartbeat. We're listening to the rhythm of a heartbeat. So that gives you a little taste. Of what, uh, of what this longer film is about. And that video will be used to help protect and preserve the forest that was shot in. So that forest could currently, um, is, is for sale. <laughs> and it is an urban forest and we are trying to save that. So there'll be more information about that coming out next week, but that's the power of the arts and how John and I love to work together. And in fact, that was Anne Mortifee's voice you heard who we've had on this program before. So I think that um, we, we, we'd love to hear more um, from all of you, but um, Jim, Sandy, do you want to just tell us, go right into some other things that you're working on, like Countdown, some other projects? Yes, we'd love to. So just, just to give you a quick idea of what count, the, the impact of Countdown. Last January, I was up um, early in the morning, as I have a tendency to do, and looking for something really inspirational about the planet. And I found this video called how we can turn the tide on climate. I was um, Googling uh, Christiana Figueres because she was the, the force behind the Paris Agreement. And I ran into Countdown and it just hit me so impactfully. This is what we've been waiting for. This is getting all the different people and organizations and everyone who cares about the earth, which is really everyone <laughs> and cares about the future and about their children and everything. It's getting us out of our silos and bringing us all together and really multiplying the impact. So yeah, Jim, do you wanna jump into Countdown? This is announcing this worldwide effort that really began with the TED project. You can see the TED logo up at the top there. And they said, you know, we have a platform where we can bring information to people that they need to understand how to live in more harmony with the planet. And so they've partnered with TED and created TEDx events that are going to be happening around the world. The countdown event is actually coming up on Saturday. And we'll remind you in just a minute or two about that. The yeah. countdown has these sections to it. So you can see that they're looking at the urgency, leadership, transformation, breakthroughs, and action. And Sandy, can you tell us who the speakers are? Uh, yeah, there's so many speakers I couldn't begin to tell you, but let's just say they go from Jane Fonda to the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> and Sandy and I, along with Francis and Jonathan, are following up next week 
with a creative solutions for a new decade. What can one person do and what can one community do? So we'll be having more information about that uh, and that partnership later. So what we're about in our classes is helping people understand what's happening. And you see in the middle here, the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is a very thin layer of nutritious gas that clings to our earth. It's so thin, it's similar to three sheets of paper on a basketball. So that's a very thin space to contain current sources of pollution. So on the left side, you see the sources that humanity has been putting into the atmosphere. And on the right-hand side, you see how nature has been taking those sources and returning them in a nutritious, healthy way. But unfortunately, 59% of the current sources of pollution emissions remain in the atmosphere every year. So how to deal with that has been a problem. And you can see what happens with the greenhouse gases that accumulate in the atmosphere. So they build up seeing here from 1960, they build every year and they're drawn down every year by natural processes. But unfortunately, the natural processes have not been able to keep up. So we need to do something more to help nature restore a balance, not only in our atmosphere, but everywhere. And here's, this is a, a slide that I think shows a little bit about how important change is. Sandy, tell us about this. Yeah, just the idea that change can happen overnight. Sometimes we think this is too overwhelming. How could we possibly do it? But look at this, Easter morning, New York City, and you can see there was one automobile in that little red circle. And then Easter morning, just 13 years later, and it's hard to even find the horse. So changes happen so rapidly when we really realize this is something we want. And so the research that Drawdown has done, the Drawdown Project, tells us we have enough solutions to do the job. And here's the framework for the solutions. So at the top, you see sources. We need to reduce the sources of greenhouse gas pollution in our atmosphere. Below, we need to support the sinks, coastal ocean sinks and engineered sinks. And in the process, we need to improve society so that there's more of a balanced use of resources. Yeah, let's just talk a little bit about how people that we've worked with in our classes are implementing these worldwide solutions. Sandy, go ahead. Yeah, we can just go through these quickly. Reducing okay. food waste is, is actually the most effective solution. We've already talked about the next one, which is switching to a plant-rich diet. That can make a huge impact. The next one is a surprising one, hugely impactful, just increasing the education level of women and girls and giving them access to choice in family planning. Forest protection, and I remember so well a Creatively United webinar that talked about the Great Bear Rainforest. And here we see the Great Bear Rainforest and Pacific Wild that has worked so hard to protect this source of reducing greenhouse gases. So people in our drawdown classes have gotten involved in so many of these solutions in many different ways. Just go quickly through the rest of them, Jim, so we can okay. just know. Habitat like the, protection. Yeah, women's education, forest protection. These are projects that different individuals have gotten actively involved in. Uh, the Sequoia solutions, uh, someone figured out a great tree planting solution. And here's one that's near and dear to our hearts. Sandy and I have uh, an array of 30 solar cells on our house uh, in Oregon. And that gives us the ability over a year's time to generate all the energy we need for heating, for cooling, for all the energy that the house consumes. And we have an electric car that you see down in the lower left 
that can be coupled into the house to back up the solar cells and provide power when the grid goes down. Amazing. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so look at all these solutions. And um, Paul Hawkins' book was really like Paul is just a friend of yours, I gather. And his how many solutions does he provide in that book, Jim? There's a hundred solutions in that book. Yeah. And we have coming up uh, an event where we're going to interview Seth Klein about his new book, A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. And he says that we did it for the Second World War. We can do it again. Yeah. Yeah. So Christina Figueres, one of the founders of the Countdown Project, says you are lucky to be alive at a time when you can make a transformative difference to the future of the whole life on Earth. And so here are some local ways that you can get involved. Uh, so going to countdown.ted.com, that will get you on for this sun, this Saturday at eight o'clock in the morning, um, Pacific time to watch amazing videos until two o'clock in the afternoon. And you can, I'm sure catch up with those later. And then we've got our five session getting into action classes. We've got another one starting in November. Um, we try to keep them running as often as we can. And that's where we create community with people working on them. And then Francis's um, Creatively United is going to be a wonderful place for you to find out more about the webinar that we're putting together as a TEDx event as part of the global launch of Countdown. Thank you, Sandy. Yes, we're a solutions hub for sure. Before we wrap up, I mean, we want to get to some questions here. I want to ask you all, what, and I'll start with Trevor, what take home message or messages might you want or wish to share with our audience today, Trevor? One of them is talk to people about this. So how do you, how do you get kitchen table conversations going? And we're, we're, we've got a draft guide that we're preparing that will help people to have those kitchen table conversations and that's available on our website which is oneplanetconversations.ca um, so that's that's a piece of it and and talk with all sorts of groups one of the groups i think that's very interesting to think about and we often don't bring them into these conversations are faith communities because every faith community somewhere in its in its center has reference to protecting the creator's creation or words to that effect um, to valuing nature or in some way or other. Uh, so we can build on those understandings. Um, I think the other um, is this isn't just about science and technology. There's a whole talk I give that's called um, heart, gut and spirit stuff. So it's this is a very emotional thing. And people have been commenting about the beauty. Um, and beauty is a really important piece to bring into this. And one of the ways to reach people uh, in their hearts and in their guts and in their spirit is through beauty and through emphasizing what a beautiful world we have and how we're going to uh, protect that earth. So, but I think it's a matter of personal relationships and a relationship with the earth as well. Agreed, yes. And John, I'm gonna jump over to you for a moment. What would you like to add? Well, my main take-home message is that by making changes, you can actually better yourself and society. I mean, I've gone onto a plant-based diet and I've got an electric bike in the last two months since I've had my electric bike. I think I've only driven my car, which is an electric car, by the way, two or three times. But most of the time, I've been hopping on and off the electric bike. I've lost about 10 pounds in weight and I feel much better and much healthier so moving towards uh, what individuals can do to be more creative and more solutions oriented is a good thing and enhances your well-being. Wonderful. And over to you, Sandy and Jim, anything to add? Just be a possibilist. <laughs> you don't have to be an optimist or a pessimist. Just know there are so many things we can do. Let's do them. Yeah. So I, yeah, I always like to remind people that, you know, the world has faced big challenges in the past one of which was the diminishing of the ozone layer. And that would have been a big disaster worldwide, but 196 nations got together and created the Montreal Protocol. And we now expect that the ozone layer is gonna be back in full functioning in the next decade or so. We can do it, folks. We have the solutions. 
And even at a global scale, we, there's optimism. There's an opportunity to really make our planet a healthy planet again and only need one planet. Absolutely. And I think the power of the positive is so important. We have to remain positive, even though it is, a, you know, there's some very dark news. Remaining positive feeds positive. We get in that dark place, we go to that dark place, and we tend to stay there. So we have to stay positive. So um, before I get into the questions that the, our lovely audience has posed to us, we have a couple of questions to pose to you. First question, if you want to ponder this, we have a couple of these. What would you do for our planet, really, for the future of all species on Earth, including humanity, if you knew you could not fail? Imagine the love of a mother for her child. Do you love our planet with that same love? If not, what might help you love her that much? Next question. I know these are a lot of questions, but food for thought, right? If the success or failure of this planet and of human beings depends on how I am and what I do, how would you be and what would you do? Hopefully your municipality has a climate action plan. If it doesn't, how can you work with others to make sure it does? If it does, how do you get it to expand that plan to become a one action plan? Food for thought again, it's all possible. How do you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your workmates, your community associations, service clubs, faith groups, start to talk about these issues of cultural evolution and value shift, make it happen. And what are the implications of value shifts, such as truly valuing nature, community, and collaboration, quality of life, rather than having more stuff? What does that mean for your daily life? I know that you spend, it seems that we spend the first half of our lives accumulating and the second half trying to let it go. And stuff just wears you down. All right. I see we've got lots of questions here. Wow. Holy moly. You guys have been busy. So I'm going to let whoever jump in uh, wants to jump in to to answer these questions. Okay. Uh, this one from Rebecca. Given the $750 million a year being spent by Exxon Mobil, the Koch brothers and others, the Merchants of Doubt, Dark Money, Professor Robert Brule, to delay, deny, and discourage drawdown, don't we need deep pockets to compete in the propaganda game to take the counter to climate, counter climate change lobby to court? What can we do? Well, one thing to think about is there are parallels to this in the past. Uh, as a public health physician, I was very involved in the 80s and 90s in the fight against big tobacco. And big tobacco actually doesn't look a whole lot different from big oil and employs many of the same tactics and in fact many of the same consultants. Um, and yet we, we didn't yet totally beat big tobacco, but we sure as hell knocked it down a hell of a long way. And we didn't do that with a lot of money. So it's, it doesn't, you don't have to fight money with money. You can fight money with brains. You can fight money with community power. You can fight money with community action. Um, it's not about how much you spend. It's about how smart you are in the way you present things. And using things such as theater and arts and so on to, to present arguments is very effective too. So uh, I think we have precedents of other big organizations, big lobbies that we have been able to at least partially turn back. And I think we just need to take those lessons and apply them. Well said. Well, anyone else want to jump in or can I move to the other point about following the money is that um, I think uh, Exxon is no longer in the New York Stock Exchange because its value has dropped so much as a result of a shift to renewable energy. And if you look at the institutional investors, pension funds and teachers associations, etc., that money is shifting significantly from oil and fossils to renewable resource investments. So that transition is already happening. And some people think that with COVID, we've actually reached peak oil and that um, from now on in, we're going to start to reduce our fossil fuel Im uh, impact over the next decade, simply because of the way we're changing our way we do business. Mm -hmm. One other thing that we can do, of course, is vote. And we yes. have voting coming up. Yay, vote for nature, vote for the earth. <laughs> yes, I agreed. And, and not to be swayed by slick messaging, but to really realize that there is there are alternatives. Um, anything else you want to add, Sandy, or can I jump into the next question? Well, I was just thinking about how I changed banks. We can all do that. We can look at our pension plans, if anybody has a pension plan anymore, see what they're investing in. 
Mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah, follow the money. Okay, um, Marnie asks, how might one become involved or help with One Planet and the conversations, or is it a closed group? I know what the answer is. <laughs> yes, well, no, it's not a closed group. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, you can email me. My email is kind of all over the place. If you get the weekly columns, it's there, but it's thancock at uvic.ca. I'm still an emeritus professor there, um, and that's the best way to reach me or through our website, oneplanetconversations.ca. But yes. certainly, it's not a closed group at all. The more, the merrier. Excellent. And this one from Colin C. Have you considered incorporating advocacy for the expansion and better management of BC's provincial park system as a crucial part of building climate change resilience? This is from the Elders Council for Parks in BC. Mm -hmm. I can jump into that one because I know many people who are elders with the uh, parks group and there is a small group we've been put together to look at how the future of parks management can contribute to a climate solution. And there's a lot of work now being done by the parks fraternity to encourage uh, better management of our forests and actually enlarge some of our conservation areas so that we create carbon credits. And I should say that in the, uh, the central coast of the Great Bay Rainforest, there's over a million dollars of carbon credits generated. So that's a lot of value that parks can, can contribute over the next decade. Excellent. Anyone else? We're good. All right. Um, another one, this one's from Brenda S. Um, my granddaughter lives in Vancouver, has just started a UVic in, has just started at UVic in environmental engineering. I would like to suggest something she might do in the form of meetings or getting information. What do you suggest? I, well, I, draw down, BC pro, draw down, you, you know, uh, Trevor, but you go ahead, Sandy, and, and then Trevor. I was gonna say right now, all our drawdown classes are online um, and we try to have them on the weekends, mostly occasionally in the evenings. And so that's one good thing to do. And you can find out more about our classes at bcdrawdown.org. And we have classes starting in November, uh, five session classes that are informative and also wonderful to meet other people that care the same way that we do about protecting our earth. There's also, if, if she's specifically at UVic, the uh, new civil engineering program at UVic headed up by Chris Kennedy, is very much about green civil engineering. And in fact, the new um, president of UVic is, a, is a, a, a civil engineer who's done environmental engineering in the past. So there's po possibilities there. And then there is a group that I helped set up at UVic, which is has been mostly faculty, but really needs students involved with it called UVic in the Anthropocene which is looking at what's the university's role in addressing the, uh, the Anthropocene. Again, uh, you can uh, contact me to be in touch with them, but, or, or talk with Chris Kennedy, who is part of that uh, um, UVic in the Anthropocene group. Wonderful. We actually have another question from Gary McDougall, who was actually one of our presenters on food and farming, one of our webinars. Uh, Gary says, I was excited to hear Trevor acknowledge we are faced with more challenges than just climate change, we need to greatly decrease our spending and resource extraction. I wonder what that could look like. How do we get our culture to change? I'm excited to hear Trevor's answer and to get these conversations happening with neighbors. Well, I think again, it, it's, I'm, I'm actually also on the board, a uh, science advisory board for a new institute that's been set up at Royal Rose University by Thomas Homer Dixon, who's just brought out a new book, incidentally, in fact, as it happens, I may as well plug it since I have it right here. Uh, his new book is called Commanding Hope. And um, I think hope is a very important piece of this that we, we've sort of implied, but we need to talk about how do we create um, hope and opportunity. When I talk to young people, I talk about the opportunities, and I liked that quote you showed earlier from Christina Frigueres about that, that in fact, changing everything, which is really what we have to do, creates all sorts of opportunities, uh, and it can be a very exciting time. Um, but I think that part of what we have to change is our whole economic system. So I've always had a very strong interest because of my interest in ecological politics, in ecological economics. And so look at ideas such as steady state economics and what that means. Uh, how, do we, um, how do we shift the, the core value of our economic system from more stuff and more growth 
to a steady state economy where the fundamental underlying value is enough rather than more. Um, mm. These are profound cultural shifts, they're value shifts, but I don't, they don't come down from the top. We have to talk about it down here and build up that cultural shift. We're actually interested in, in our work in um, the experience in the late 19th and early 20th century in the Nordic countries of what they called folk building, which is uh, public development, public uplifting. And how do you lift up the consciousness, the, the values, the culture of an entire uh, community, an entire nation? And ultimately, that's what we're talking about. But again, it doesn't come from the top. I'm not waiting for those folks up there to make changes. They're too vested in the way things are. Mm -hmm. So we have to change it down here by talking to each other and making the small, it's, it's a bunch of small changes that will make the difference. Agreed. And we still need to vote, though. And Roger asks, in the midst of a chaotic election in BC, how can we elect candidates that will provide the necessary climate leadership instead of promising new bridge, some way, subways to nowhere, a site C for power we don't need, and losing a valley we do need? The Green Party only has 14% support. How do we change that? Well, I might add, you vote for what you want and believe that you'll get it. I mean, look at Elizabeth May. She found herself, you know, against all the odds, be becoming... Uh, an MP for quite some time and it all and you get a minority government uh, then you have the potential of more balance of power it happens gradually but we still have to believe it can happen so vote your values don't vote out of fear or what you're being told anyone else want to jump into that just wanted to put a plug in for the new generation that's coming along this mm -hmm. is the group that's really going to provide long-term solutions and I believe in them and uh, it's any way that we can support young people and support the way that they are dealing with the world that they're going to inherit. I think they get it. That's why we need to lower the voting age to 16. It's there, you know, they, they understand. Stand. And there's always polls done in the high schools, like that they have their own polls. And I know for a fact that even the elementary schools, they all vote green because they want a greener planet. Trevor, what do you, what do you have to say? Well, obviously vote green. Um, but um, as long as you have in your head this idea they're only 14%, why would I vote for them? They'll always be 14%. You have to vote for them. They won't get beyond 14% if you don't vote for them. Precisely. So, as, as, as Francis says, vote your values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so true. And don't listen to the rhetoric from other parties because they, they use things like vote splitting and all this nonsense, which it really is. You can look at the stats. None of that is, there's not a lot of truth in it. Maybe in some writings, but in most cases not. So um, there's a lot of great um, suggestions from people to from the questions that we pose to the audience love it thank you everyone for doing that and someone asked could we get these questions as a worksheet seems like a great journal prompt series yes i think that's a great idea thanks maya john would you like to share with us uh next wednesday's 11 a.m webinar details last week we demonstrated the power of music to empower both individuals and communities to tackle climate and the biodiversity crisis next week it's the turn of power of art. The webinar is entitled Arts of Laughing, Arts of Weeping, Equipment for Earth Lovers. As this title indicates, we will witness a feast of artistic creativity by two of the world's foremost artists who combine climate stories with their art. Bob Havelock is a Manitoba artist, educator and theologian who works with community groups using arts, especially comedy, to help engage issues of against violence of, of the earth and her creatures. Recently, he was appointed as a Trudeau Foundation mentor to aid emerging scholars to better use their work for purposes of social transformation. Gennady Ivanov is a UK artist born in Belarus and lived early in Russia. A graduate from Norwich University in England, he is an artist who works simultaneously in several directions and styles. His paintings demand both an intellectual an emotional response with a visual grandeur. And you'll see one of these paintings is featured on next week's banner. The webinar promises to be informative, exciting, and a slightly wild ride into the interconnection between arts and climate. It's not to be missed. Oh, agreed. And I'd love to leave you with a couple quotes 
And I just want to thank Sandy, Jim, Trevor, John, everybody for listening. And I just think you'll appreciate these quotes. Operating consistently in a creative orientation is neither magical nor mystical. It is simply people working at their best, passionate and personally committed, yet selflessly being stewards for a future. A creator is always creating something new and having to learn new knowledge and comp competencies. However, sometimes we learn new comp competencies. We don't look that good because we aren't. That's a current reality. But the ability to bring into being what matters to us far surpasses any discomfort we may have in the learning process. Practicing the creative process continuously expands our ability to create our future. So to creating all of you, thank you so much for attending today. And agreed, Miho, laughter is the best medicine. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Bye for now.